So in 2017, uh, Sea Shepherd, off the coast of Africa, located a notorious fishing vessel called the Libico 2. This vessel was internationally blacklisted on three different lists. It's estimated that this vessel, this one ship, was responsible for killing 500,000 sharks every year. So you do the math, you know, four years later, just by stopping this one illegal vessel, we've saved the lives of over two million sharks. That's one vessel women's rights, human rights, animal rights, environmental protections. Every one of us plays a role in standing up and saying that this is not okay. The status quo must change. It's time to change the world. It's time for something better. We're telling the stories of people who are changing the world and how you can help. Our daily actions have a massive impact. So what will we do about it? We can remake the world because guess what? We can. Hi, everyone. I'm Nathan Gardner, and this is We Can Remake the World, a podcast about people who are changing the world and how you can help. We like to start every episode with a few pieces of good news. And in the spirit of our most recent episode, All About Hope, today we're focusing on stories of hope, hopeless circumstances that have taken a turn for the better. So here's the good news for today. First, we go to Ohio, where the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, just south of Cleveland, offers us a glimpse into what's possible when people commit to cleaning up their own mess. The story here begins in 1940, before the national park existed, when a 200-acre plot of land in the area within what is now the national park was set aside and used as a waste dump. First, private citizens dumped their trash and waste. This was before local cities offered waste management. Then, later, industry, including manufacturers, chemical companies, and more, began relying on this 200-acre plot of land to dispose of toxic industrial wastes of all kinds. In 1974, then-President Gerald Ford designated the area that includes this 200-acre plot of land the Cuyahoga National Recreation Area, but visitors were getting sick because of years of accumulated toxic heavy metals, pesticides, arsenic, paints, and other industrial waste products, the soil and water were so polluted that the soil was actually flammable. The National Park Service knew something needed to be done, so they committed to a 25-year cleanup program. But a program like that, with a scale that large, needs funding. They hired a former Colorado assistant attorney general named Sean Mulligan to represent the National Park Service in a lawsuit against corporations including Chevron and Chrysler, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, Federal Metal Company, 3M, and others. The lawsuit was eventually settled, giving the National Park Service $21 million in funding to manage the cleanup, with Ford and GM committing additional resources to actually carry out the cleanup themselves, with oversight from the National Park Service. It's often cheaper if companies can do it themselves, and then if they report to the public organization, there can be accountability. Thousands of barrels of toxic waste and nearly 400,000 tons of contaminated soil were removed from what is now the National Park. In some cases, up to 20 feet of soil had to be taken out to prevent toxic waste from infecting future human, animal, and plant residents and visitors. In 2021, the National Park Service officially announced the completion of the project just last year, which has turned this former deadly dumping site into a thriving wetland with native grasses, wildflowers, and returning wildlife. This story gives me hope because it's a microcosm of what's possible around the world. People recognizing the harm they've caused holding the ones responsible accountable for contributing to the remedying of whatever the problem is, and then designing a program of restoration and carrying it out in collaboration with public, private, and community interests and groups. This is the kind of story we could see play out across every continent where environmental exploitation and destruction have taken place over decades. And it also shows that even the most toxic, hopeless situations can be remedied and restored with enough resources and commitment from people. Our next piece of good news comes from Detroit 
and Assam, India, where native wildlife is rebounding in both places. In Detroit, wild river otters have been spotted in the Detroit River, which separates the United States and Canada, for the first time in over 100 years. Otter and beaver populations were essentially wiped out in this region by fur traders in the late 19th century, and pollution prevented these animals from rebounding and returning as the fur trade dwindled. But wild otters released in Ohio years ago have made their way back to Michigan, which is a hugely positive sign for the health of local ecosystems. Otters are a keystone species that indicate healthy waters, so their return means conditions in the fresh waters around Michigan are finally improving. In the state of Assam, India, the greater one-horned rhino is rebounding after coming so close to extinction 50 years ago that only 100 individuals lived still in the wild. Now, that number has risen to just over 4,000 individuals, thanks to strict protection and conservation measures taken in India and in neighboring Nepal, the only two countries where the one-horned rhino exists. Populations were also helped by a baby boom during the COVID pandemic, which came about due to many protected wildlife areas being closed to the public over the last couple of years. We love a silver lining after everything we went through, right? This encouraging story is motivating India to continue to expand the size of its wildlife-protected areas, which is already happening throughout the country, and to continue successful patrolling of these areas to protect wildlife from poachers and other human threats. Both stories offer more evidence that when humans give nature the space to recover, it will do so, happily and quickly. Let's keep telling stories like this to show us what's possible everywhere. And finally, we go to Denver, Colorado, where the first carbon-negative hotel in the United States is being built. The Populous Hotel, designed by Chicago's Studio Gang and funded by developer Urban Villages, is set to open in late 2023 on a prominent city corner, which is the former site of the first gas station in the state of Colorado. A bit of poetic justice to balance the scales there. Using design elements inspired by Colorado's iconic aspen trees, the building will be a model for future real estate projects where sustainability and carbon offsetting will be as much of a priority as profitability. John Buerge, chief development officer of developer Urban Villages, was quoted as saying, Internally, we often say if we can show people how to make money doing the right thing to change the world, it can be replicated. We have to make sure that the decisions we're making are good for the planet and good for the business. No argument here. Let's get to our episode. So often we look out at the world and wonder how we can make a difference. The challenges feel so large, and an answer to the question of what can I do can feel so far away. Captain Paul Watson of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society found his answer, and it didn't involve sitting back and letting someone else solve the problem for him. A founding director of the global environmental nonprofit Greenpeace back in the 1970s, Paul Watson wanted to get things done. He wasn't interested in protesting, petitioning, or politics. He wanted to take action, to disrupt the systems of exploitation he saw playing out all around him. So he did. Captain Watson founded Sea Shepherd in 1977 to protect and conserve all marine wildlife. Sea Shepherd works to conserve all living things in the world's oceans through direct action campaigns, media campaigns, and partnerships with governments and other global nonprofits and NGOs. Sea Shepherd is probably most widely known for the many times it's been featured in documentaries around the world, like The Cove, Defend, Conserve, Protect, and Sea Spiracy the hugely popular Netflix film released in 2021, which I think many of us watched in horror during lockdown last year. Sea Shepherd was also the focus of the popular reality TV show Whale Wars, which aired for seven years on the Animal Planet channel in the U.S. from 2008 to 2015. There's a reason Sea Shepherd comes up anytime the topic of protecting the oceans is raised. 
For many years, the Sea Shepherd team has been physically out on the open ocean, disrupting illegal fishing operations and documenting evidence of it being carried out around the world, sometimes putting their safety at risk. But why? What caused Captain Paul Watson to create this organization to fight illegal fishing operations? What is Sea Shepherd so concerned about? Are our oceans really in need of so much protection from illegal fishing? How much is actually going on, anyway? A lot, it turns out. So much, actually, that if you ate seafood in the last week, there's a 60% chance it was caught illegally. Illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, or IUU fishing, is a huge global problem, and it's destroying our oceans. There are international laws protecting wildlife and ensuring sustainable fishing practices throughout the oceans, but they're often not followed and rarely well enforced. For example, in the United States, which is the world's largest seafood importer, only 40% of the seafood imported is properly traced to its source, to the people who caught it, with detailed information about how much was caught from where and how. So this means that 60% of the seafood in the U.S. has very little transparency, which opens the door for illegal fishing operations to sell their products in the U.S., and in many cases in markets all around the world. The journal Marine Policy found in 2014 that at least 32% of fish sold in all restaurants and markets like supermarkets was caught illegally. 32%. And many believe that the number is currently at least 40%. The United States imported an estimated $2.4 billion worth of seafood derived from illegal fishing in 2019 alone. The seafood industry is notoriously difficult to regulate, for obvious reasons, because so much of the work is done away from land, where the oversight is almost non-existent. A fishing vessel can also mislabel what they sell when they get to port to sell their catch, leading to more problems with tracking, fishing quota management, and consumer transparency. The ocean conservation nonprofit Oceana released a report which stated that 44% of seafood was mislabeled in American retail outlets. The organization carried out DNA testing of random samples of seafood taken from restaurants and grocery stores throughout the United States, Canada, and other countries, and the results were alarming. For any sushi eaters, your menus are actually lying to you, and the restaurants have no idea. This report by Oceana found that 74% of fish used in sushi restaurants overall was not what it claimed to be. That's huge! Three quarters of the fish on the menu is not what it says it is. Tuna and red snapper were especially inaccurate. There's a 59% chance that your spicy tuna roll doesn't actually have any tuna in it. Which begs the question, what did you eat? And this isn't an isolated problem. In Northern California, 76% of sushi restaurants sold mislabeled fish, so you can't trust the menus. In New York, Washington, D.C., and Chicago, every single sushi restaurant that was tested was selling some mislabeled fish, at least. And in Houston and Austin, every single sample tested was mislabeled. Nothing was what the menu said it was. Not a fan of sushi? You're still not safe. Shark meat, often high in toxic mercury, was found in fish tacos in California. Toxic pufferfish, labeled as monkfish, to escape import laws in the U.S. has caused serious illness. Other commonly mislabeled fish are halibut, grouper, cod, and the endangered Chilean sea bass. And salmon is mislabeled as well. Half of the crab cakes sold in Maryland and Washington, D.C. were made with an Asian crab species, not the overfished local blue crab that the fishing industry promised they were selling to markets and restaurants. This shows how easy it is for fishing vessels to lie, cheat, and steal from the ocean with no regulation and then sell their products anyway to a market where demand for seafood is so high and growing that they can find a way to get away with it. For this and many other reasons, Sea Shepherd has been watching global fishing operations closely for decades and in many cases, directly intervening to block illegal fishing operations, to protect not just our oceans and our wildlife, but also to protect us from ourselves. 
when illegal fishing goes down, our oceans become healthier. And we need healthy oceans, now more than ever. As we continue to raise billions and billions of animals around the world for slaughter for human consumption, we're compromising ecosystems on land and in the oceans. We currently raise and kill over 70 billion land animals and almost 100 million tons of ocean animals a year, which alone produces more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation industry. We have to speak about ocean animals in weight because the numbers of individual animals being caught and killed are so high that nobody can truly accurately measure them. 40% of all the fish taken from the ocean is actually fed to chickens and pigs and domestic house cats. 2.8 million tons of fish go to cats alone every year. This is food that could be feeding people. We are literally eating the ocean alive to feed our appetite for animal products and to feed our pets. How does this affect the health of the oceans and the health of the planet, other than the greenhouse gases? Since 1950, we've lost 40% of our phytoplankton population in the global oceans, which provides 50% or more of the oxygen we breathe throughout the planet. Whales contribute to phytoplankton ecosystems greatly, and since we've killed 90% of the ocean's whales, we are losing phytoplankton at an alarming rate. Our hunger for seafood is now endangering our long-term ability to breathe. According to the Pew Charitable Trust, in 2014 alone, roughly 500 million metric tons of tuna was caught worldwide. Want to know how many pounds that is? 11,023,115,000 pounds in one year. According to Science Daily, Seabird populations declined by 70% between 1950 and 2010 due to depleted fisheries in the world's oceans. And researchers estimate that about 100 million sharks are killed per year, which means at least 11,500 and as many as 30,000 are killed per hour. Sharks are going extinct at a time when we are just beginning to understand how crucial they are to marine ecosystems. Every year, over 300,000 dolphins, whales, and porpoises are killed by fishing operations, including over 10,000 that are killed off the coast of France annually. This isn't just in Asia or remote corners of the ocean. And the reason these numbers are so huge is because of how many fishing vessels there are out there on the waters. There are currently about 4.6 million confirmed commercial fishing vessels on the oceans, but that doesn't include vessels fishing illegally, necessarily. The total number is likely closer to 5 million, and many of these vessels are massive and operating every day. Now it starts to make sense how this alone is having such a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions. When illegal fishing is happening, which includes any vessel not following quotas, species-specific restrictions, fishing in protected areas, or violating national boundaries, which is all happening all the time, those 5 million vessels can do whatever they want to generate as much profit as possible. There are human rights implications here, too. According to the International Labor Organization, 24,000 fisheries workers die every year on the job. That's a huge number and it's 16 times higher than the mortality rates for firefighters or police in the United States, and 40 times the U.S. national average for other industries. Ever wonder how canned tuna was kept so cheap? Well, modern slavery and human trafficking are part of the answer to that question. Forced labor in the seafood trade has been reported in 47 countries, with high-risk countries including Ireland, Taiwan, South Korea, China, Honduras, South Africa, the Philippines, and Vietnam, just to name some. Greenpeace successfully petitioned the U.S. Department of Labor in 2020 to include seafood caught by China and Taiwan on the list of goods produced by child labor or forced labor. But this isn't just about canned tuna. If you regularly eat sushi or sashimi in any restaurant in the United States or Europe, you're very likely to have consumed Chinese or Taiwanese caught fish, where human rights concerns are serious. I know that was a lot of numbers to throw at you, but I think it's important to understand the scale of what's going on out there and the scope, the impact of illegal fishing operations around the world. This is huge. So what can we do in the face of all this? What has Sea Shepherd done? Sea Shepherd has decided to become the only organization consistently enforcing international law 
on the open ocean. In its early days, Sea Shepherd was all about direct action. Sea Shepherd's first mission involved chasing a notorious illegal whaling vessel until the opportunity came to ram and damage the ship, which is what happened. Captain Paul Watson, who was on board, communicated his intention to ram the vessel to the crew so that they could maintain their own safety, and was successful in ramming this vessel three times to cause major damage. This speaks to what Captain Watson calls aggressive nonviolence, a tactic that Sea Shepherd has continued to employ to disrupt illegal fishing operations around the globe. Being aggressive and assertive, but not causing harm, not injuring others. Sea Shepherd ships have also chased illegal fishing boats into ports around the world, where local authorities can detain and arrest the crews. And in some cases, this has led to official sinking of those illegal boats by the local governments. Sea Shepherd also records and documents illegal fishing operations to prove to authorities that vessels are breaking international law. What Sea Shepherd has recognized is that, unfortunately, nobody is truly protecting the oceans or marine wildlife consistently around the world, which is another way to say that nobody's protecting humanity from its own destruction of itself, since the health of our oceans is so closely tied to the health of our species. And instead of waiting for governments to step in or for industries to regulate themselves, Sea Shepherd has stepped up to take action. They've disrupted major illegal operations around the world, which we'll hear about in a moment, for decades, preventing the needless and illegal deaths of countless living things and holding the front line for the long-term health of our planet. Today we'll speak with Tamara Arenovich, longtime Sea Shepherd supporter and volunteer and currently a full-time member of the Sea Shepherd team. If you saw the Netflix documentary Sea Spiracy, you may recognize Tamara. She was present with Ali Tabrizi, one of the filmmakers and the star of Sea Spiracy, for the filming of the annual dolphin run and slaughter and capture of many dolphins in Taiji, Japan. Tamara helps us understand how Sea Shepherd's approach to ocean conservation has evolved, how they're partnering with governments around the world to extend their reach, why we must care about the oceans enough to get involved, and why she believes that if everyone could see what she's seen, the world would change overnight. So I'm really excited today to be speaking with Tamara Arenovich, Head of Media and Communications for the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Thanks so much, Tamara, for making time for us. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm a fan of your show. Oh, thanks so much. Appreciate you saying that. And yeah, I mean, the pleasure is mine. I've been following Sea Shepherd for some time, and I think that it's a really important and inspiring organization. And I'm just excited to learn more, you know, to hear from your perspective about the work that Sea Shepherd does and how it does it. So if you don't mind, maybe just start us off by sharing, you know, what is Sea Shepherd and what makes it unique as far as how it carries out its work? Sure. Um, well, I guess the short answer to that is that Sea Shepherd is an international nonprofit ocean conservation organization. You and perhaps some of your listeners might be familiar with Sea Shepherd already, perhaps from our work on the TV show, the TV series Whale Wars, um, which featured our efforts to stop illegal whaling in the Southern Ocean. Sea Shepherd has been around for a very, very long time, actually since 1977, and there is so much more than illegal whaling that we're involved in today. So I look forward to speaking with you today and talking about some of the work that we're doing around the world and why this work is so critically important to you, to me, and to all of us in our future. I'd say a few features that are unique to Sea Shepherd are, number one, we are largely a volunteer-driven organization. And secondly, we are a direct action organization. Our mission is to defend marine wildlife in the world's oceans from illegal exploitation and environmental destruction. We partner with governments around the world to stop illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in national waters. And we collaborate with conservation researchers contributing to scientific knowledge that's needed to shape policy and enhance protections for marine wildlife around the world. Yeah, I mean, the breadth is huge, you know, the research and sort of educational aspects and the diversity of the species that Sea Shepherd is focused on in its work. I mean, it's really impressive. I just want to start by asking you to elaborate on 
what makes something a direct action organization? You know, how is Sea Shepherd unique in that sense? Because I think that's really what encapsulates the personality of Sea Shepherd, um, this, this idea of direct action. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and direct action is a little bit of a loaded term. What does that actually mean? I, I suppose the answer to that is a little bit fluid. Direct action in its most, I guess, concrete sense means we are intervening between the crimes that are taking place that are threatening marine wildlife and the perpetrators of those crimes. So in the past, um, back in our early years, we had a bit of a reputation as outlaws or <laughs> pirates, um, vigilantes of the sea that were fighting uh, to protect marine species. And indeed, our, our, our logo is a Jolly Roger. So I mean, I think that that's warranted. But the methods that we used in our early days, you know, physically intervening between an illegal whaling ship and the harpoon that's aimed for that whale, um, they made sense at the time. You know, like this was 20, 30 years ago, very few laws were in place, very little enforcement was in place. This was the way to truly make a difference at that time. And it was highly impactful and effective. Now, from our small grassroots beginnings, those early years, Sea Shepherd has evolved into something even more powerful and even more effective. We are um, an ocean conservation organization, but we're more than that. I would say that today, Sea Shepherd is really a global movement. And we are working with, in partnership with governments around the world to help protect marine wildlife from illegal exploitation in national waters all around the world. So direct action, you know, in the 1970s and 1980s versus today takes on a somewhat different form, but we still, you know, our priority is absolutely our clients, the whales, the dolphins, the, the sharks and the sea turtles and other marine wildlife that so desperately need our help. And like I said, we have a number of instruments that we use, government partnerships, scientific collaborations to help us directly impact and mitigate these threats. Yeah, I think it's pretty amazing how the organization seems to have sort of matured in its approach. And, you know, not that it's immature to take direct action. Sometimes, as you said, that's the absolute best you know, path given the circumstances, but to understand at a certain point that there's more available to the organization. There are partnerships that can be built and through the greater movement that has been built and people's support and the sort of, you know, almost awareness that Sea Shepherd can bring, bringing those channels in as well, in addition to some of the direct action work that I know still happens and I can't wait to ask you more about. Um, would you speak about, you know, what do you do for Sea Shepherd? What brought you to the organization? What keeps you passionate about the work that Sea Shepherd does? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I wasn't always a, um, a marine ocean conservation activist. My background is actually in healthcare and academia, and I lived a relatively normal life for uh, many, many years. But in my spare time, when I could escape from you know office life, I um, I'm an avid scuba diver and free diver, and I've always had a love affair with the ocean. Um, if you've ever been underneath the waves, you understand what I'm talking about. It's a completely different world, and it's magical had a few incredible encounters. I was very fortunate to experience some, you know, close-up encounters with sharks, with endangered turtles. And these, um, you know, these experiences changed me and I felt a certain sense of of, of debt. Um, you know, I, I can think of one experience in particular where I had an amazing close up encounter with a hammerhead shark off the coast of Hawaii. And, uh, it was terrifying at the time and it was also mesmerizing. And I left that, I left that dive a changed person sort of thinking, you know, realistically, that is not my environment. I'm slow. I'm awkward. I've got equipment attack, attached to me. And if that animal truly was this mindless killing machine that, you know, that the media would have you believe, I would never even see it coming. I would have been dead in an instant. It didn't want to harm me. I had no business being there and it didn't want to harm me. And then I got to thinking about, you know, like how many of them do we harm? We can't say the same that the reverse is true. I mean, we kill hundreds of thousands of sharks every year without cause, you know? And so, 
I felt like a bit of a promise was made in that moment that I needed to do more and and to try to help. And so I did. I'm uh, I'm from Canada. I'm originally from Toronto. And uh, one freezing cold day in February, I happened to be walking around in the city and saw a bunch of activists demonstrating outside of the Japanese embassy. It was so cold. <laughs> February in, <laughs> in Canada is cold. And uh, these people were standing out there so passionate, freezing. And um, so I kind of went to see what was going on. And it was a demonstration on World Love for Dolphins Day. It was Valentine's Day um, that was demonstrating against the annual... Uh, uh, slaughter of dolphins that takes place six months out of the year every year off the coast of uh, Taiji in Japan. So that was my local Sea Shepherd chapter who was there demonstrating. It was my first uh, experience with them. I became a member not too long after that and helped locally to raise awareness, raise funds for our ships and our campaigns and so on. Um, after that, I ultimately kind of felt like I needed to continue doing more. Um, and that started me on my journey onto the ships and onto our ground campaigns around the world. Since that time, I've been a crew member on 10 Sea Shepherd campaigns directly from those bloody shores in Japan to, um, to the west coast of Canada and, and the BC salmon farms. Um, I've been in the Caribbean helping survivors of climate change-induced national disasters. I've uh, spent many years in Mexico helping protect the world's most endangered marine mammal, the vaquita porpoise. And I've also had the privilege of seeing some of the world's most pristine waters, the marine protected areas where we are actually protecting marine wildlife. I've had the absolute privilege to dive under those waters and see what the oceans can and should look like when we just let them be. You know, they have the ability to heal and to recover if we just stop applying such immense pressure. And it's magical and it's inspiring. And so, so that's been my history on the ships. After that, I've kind of, at the moment, moved over into a bit more of a behind-the-scenes role, assisting with um, communications, helping to tell the story and highlight the incredible efforts that our crews and our volunteers are doing around the world to um, to, ch to take on some of the biggest challenges facing our oceans and marine wildlife around the world. Hmm. Oh my gosh, there's so much I want to ask you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I also want to ask you about the experience of being on these ships, because for people who aren't familiar with Sea Shepherd, there are volunteers who work on the ships who actually are involved in this direct action. You'll speak about it certainly better than I can, but I'd love to hear you describe maybe the work of the volunteers, what's involved, you know, how long are people on the ships and what's the work they're doing and what's that experience of like of getting so close to these campaigns, of being out on the open ocean, of really standing between illegal fishing vessels and the wildlife that Sea Shepherd is trying to protect. Can you just paint that picture for us a bit? I have a friend, that's how we were connected, who worked on a Sea Shepherd ship. Some of her stories are amazing. And I got just a tiny fraction. So I'd love to hear you speak about that. Sure. I'll, I'll try my best. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it's an incredible and frankly life-changing experience. And if you or your listeners ever have the opportunity to volunteer on one of our ships, I, I highly recommend it. It's, um, it's an experience unlike any other. So in terms of personalities and personnel. Uh, we have people, volunteers, crew members from all walks of life all around the world in a very in a variety of roles. It, it takes, it really does take a village to run one of these campaigns. So of course we need a really, you know, strong leader. We have a captain on board. We have officers helping the captain in the bridge. Um, we have engineers, of course, who keep our, our ship running and make sure that everything is, you know, safe and, and, uh, we can continue to operate. We have our deck crew. The deck crew do a lot of great work ranging from, um, you know, keeping the boat clean and in good condition. They're also often the ones who are on the front lines in campaigns where we're directly doing something like retrieving nets. It's often the deck crew that are out there getting their hands dirty in the best possible way. Mm. Um, we have an amazing chef or depending on the size of the, of the ship, we sometimes have multiple chefs on our, on our ships. Um, all of our ships are fully plant-based. 
because you yeah, know animal that. agriculture is a yeah. leading cause to of environmental change and um and also you know it doesn't really make sense to be saving one animal while consuming another so while we're on our ships all of us are fully plant based consume a fully plant based diet which is amazing and delicious and good fuel for your body we also have media crew on board which is usually where i step in so we have um videographers, photographers, um, you know, like Paul Watson, our founder, has said before, the most powerful weapon that we have on our vessels is the camera. Um, you know, our ability to bring these stories to, you know, the attention of the world is in itself a powerful tool, activism tool to allow us to help, you know, really change the outcome of these of these stories. Um, so we've got media crew on board. I'm sure I'm missing some more people. Um, essentially though, we've got a variety of incredibly talented individuals coming from all around the world, working together to help make this each campaign and each ship, uh, as successful as can be. Now it's a little bit of an interesting experience from a human perspective, um, in that, you know, you're working long hours and in a very intense environment. Everybody's passionate. Everybody's here because they care. They care so much that they've uprooted their lives, their comfort, oftentimes their job, you know, to, to do something and to truly make an impact and to help change the world for the better. And so that in itself, I find incredibly inspiring and motivating. I think our crew and our volunteers are some of the most incredible people I've ever had the privilege of knowing. But it's also really interesting that, you know, we've got people from all around the world. People sometimes, you know, in their 70s and people who've just turned 18 and just barely passed the threshold to be allowed on our ships. It's an interesting experience to watch people come together and work together and form relationships and friendships that extend well beyond, you know, the duration of the campaigns themselves. I'm, I have an enormous, you know, extended Sea Shepherd family around the world from my time on the ships and I'm immensely grateful for that. So let's zoom in on some of the current campaigns that are ongoing in Sea Shepherd. I'd love to hear you describe, if you would, a couple examples of ongoing campaigns and, you know, what's at stake here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a number of campaigns currently underway all around the world that I'm happy to talk to you about. I guess uh, the first one that comes to mind is one of our longest running campaigns, uh, which is taking place in Mexico in the upper Gulf of California. And this is our effort to protect the world's most endangered marine mammal, the vaquita porpoise. Um, so we call this Operation Milagro, Milagro being Spanish for miracle. And it, it, I think the vaquita itself is a bit of a miracle, but I, I'm not sure of the initial reasoning behind the name, but I guess the feeling was that it would take a miracle to save this animal, um, which is really facing extinction within our lifetimes. A few years ago, there were less than 100 vaquitas left. Then there were less than 30. At present, uh, there's less than 20 vaquitas left. This is an endemic animal that can only be found in a small region in Mexico's upper Gulf of California. California. It's a porpoise. It's a type of porpoise. Um, and it's, I don't know if you've seen one before, but they're absolutely adorable. They are, they're small. They kind of look like they're smiling. They've got like black circles around their eyes and their lips. And they're sometimes referred to as the panda of the sea because they are absolutely beautiful and cute. And unfortunately they're facing imminent extinction due to illegal fishing. So being marine mammals, the vaquita, uh, they have to come up to the surface to breathe air, like all cetaceans, whales, and dolphins. And um, their livelihood is threatened because they become entangled in illegal gill nets that are being placed in the area. When um, the vaquitas get tangled in these nets, they can't surface and they ultimately end up drowning under the ocean. Now, nobody's actually trying to kill the vaquita. They are unfortunately... Um, the loss of the vaquita is an unfortunate consequence of some illegal fishing that's happening. They're bycatch, essentially, in these nets that are being placed uh, to catch another endangered species called the totoaba. And the totoaba is a type of large sea, uh, sorry, large sea bass um, that can be found in the area, and its swim bladders are on high demand in the Chinese black market. So they sell for 
tens of thousands of dollars on the Chinese black market and are often referred to as the cocaine of the sea due to the exorbitant prices that they fetch. Um, and because there is such a large amount of money involved, of course, nefarious characters become involved as well, too. And the cartel is often involved in, you know, the trade of these uh, swim bladders. So the vaquita, who's just living its life in the only place in the world where it can survive, unfortunately, is approximately the same size as these totoaba fish. And so the nets that are designed to catch and kill totoaba are also perfect killing machines for the vaquita and they become entangled. And that's the reason this, uh, this species is now facing extinction. Now, Sea Shepherd has been out there working with local authorities since 2015 to help initially to, first of all, verify that the vaquita does in fact still exist because one of the arguments against its protection is that it's already extinct, so why bother? Um, but I can assure you that it's not extinct. Um, we work with world-class vaquita researchers, and as recently as this last fall, uh, we took part in a vaquita survey out there in the waters to actual get some, actually get some visual sightings of the vaquita. I believe we saw six to eight adults and one to two calves during that time, which is, um, I mean, it couldn't make our hearts any happier. It's proof positive that this animal still exists, and we will continue fighting for them. So, we, so we work with scientists to establish the location and size of the remaining population so that we can help to guide conservation efforts. In the early years of Operation Milagro, we were very involved in directly removing these nets from the water that were, that were the cause of the decline of the species. From there, we've evolved even further to where we now have a very active, collaborative partnership with the government of Mexico and work closely with them to help detect any illegal fishing activities and any nets present in the water, um, the Navy swoops in and um, prevents these nets from ever being placed in the Vaquita Refuge, which is wow. a UNESCO recognized um, and federally protected area. So it's evolved from like, you know, an early attempt to see whether this seemingly mythological creature still in fact exists to getting our hands really dirty. And I spent many years out there myself pulling in. We've Sea Shepherd has retrieved over a thousand illegal gill nets um, from that area over the years, directly saving the lives of over 400 animals that were entangled in those nets. And indirectly saving countless more. Um, if not for those efforts, I have no doubt that the vaquita would already be extinct but it's not. And um, now we're at the point where not only are we not, we're no longer removing those nets, but we're actually preventing them from ever entering the habitat in the first place, which is, which is ultimately where we need to be. And it's, and it's wonderful to see it um, progressing in this, in this manner. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really great, clear sort of zoomed in example of what's going on around the ocean where people want a, what is perceived as a product, something that is a commodity in the way that the world treats it, you know, unfortunately, in some cases, um, in all cases, I guess. And there, essentially, there's a market for this thing. And in order to catch this creature, we must sacrifice so many more. And, you know, bycatch, the term that you used, dolphins, sharks, uh, every manner of uh, sea turtles of animal gets caught in these nets around the world. What's unique about IUU fishing or illegal fishing where Sea Shepherd is primarily focused? And why is it so important for us to be aware of these illegal fishing practices and the impact that they have? Oh, well, that's a big question. And I'll, I'll give you, I guess, a big answer to it. But um, first of all, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing is absolutely one of the biggest threats facing our oceans today. And to give you a sense of why uh, we focus on IUU fishing as, as a primary focus of Sea Shepherd these days, I can give you an example. So in 2017, uh, sea Shepherd off the coast of Africa, so in partnership with the Liberian Ministry of National Defense, located a notorious fishing vessel called the Libico 2. This vessel was internationally blacklisted on three different lists. The Libico 2 was licensed to fish using longline fishing gear, but when we actually had boots on the ground and eyes on the water and officials boarded the vessel, they discovered that it was actually deploying gill nets. So gill nets, again, we just talked about them in relation to the vaquita. These are 
enormous, large rectangular nets that sit underneath the surface of the water. They can be several kilometers in length at time, responsible for a staggering amount of bycatch. Um, and it's a far more destructive method of fishing than the long lines that this fish was actually uh, that this vessel was actually licensed to fish with. Bycatch, of course, is the capture and kill of non-target species and can include whales, dolphins, sea turtles, rays. So when officials boarded the Labico 2, they found that it was illegally fishing for sharks using gill nets, and it was fishing for sharks to produce shark liver oil. You can only imagine how many sharks it takes to produce shark liver oil. Um, it's estimated that this vessel, this one ship, was responsible for killing 500,000 sharks every year. Oh um, so with support from Sea Shepherd... Liberian officials arrested the vessel and all of these violations, and to date, it hasn't returned to sea. So that was back in 2017. Um, so you do the math, you know, four years later, just by stopping this one illegal vessel, we've saved the lives of over two million sharks. That's one vessel. Um, so you can see, I mean, it kind of both gives a sense of the scope of the problem of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing just with that one vessel. And it also really speaks to the impact that Sea Shepherd can have by focusing our efforts in working in national waters to, to prevent illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. And this is exactly why, you know, we've our focus these days is um, in working with par in partnership with governments to collaborate to help them in their in their efforts to protect their own national waters. Um, oftentimes, the laws exist to protect these waters, but the resources may not. Um, and Sea Shepherd does have a vessel. We have amazing crews. You know, we have a fleet all around the world. So by collaborating with governments, we're able to help them to keep boots on the ground, eyes on the water, um, and you know, detect these sources of uh, situations and hopefully put a stop to them as was the case with the Libigo too. Wow. That number just floors me. And, you know, and that's just the sharks. If there are these, if there are these nets that are two kilometers long and all of the bycatch there, I can't even imagine the number of lives saved beyond just the number of sharks. Cause it's not like you can just, you know, pull up a massive net like that and just pick everything else out except for the sharks, you know, it's. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, um, I mean, that was my experience many years on Operation Milagro protecting the vaquita as well, too. It's um, during the years when we were retrieving nets, it's a, uh, it's an emotionally taxing situation. So prevention is key, right? If we can get those ships to ever to pre if we can prevent them from deploying those nets in the first place, you know, that's where we need to be to really, to really have an impact here. And the best way to do that is to work in collaboration with the governments that are making the laws to help enforce those laws. And I think there was another campaign that you and I had spoken about briefly that's happening sort of in the Galapagos. And uh, I think it's a Chinese distant water fishing vessel that is primarily focused on you know, harvesting squid, but I'd love to hear you speak about that campaign as well. Yeah, so this, this past summer, Sea Shepherd set out on a mission uh, to investigate the Chinese distant water squid fishing fleet, um, which is an enormous industrial fishing fleet, and very little is known about this fleet. Um, so during this investigation, Univision and the Associated Press were on board with us to, to see what we could find out about their activities. Um, and so during this investigation, we managed to visually cite or ground truth 30 vessels in the enormous fleet and detected numerous uh, maritime violations on those vessels. And I would imagine that each of these 30 vessels is huge. Enormous. Yeah, we do have, um, I believe it's on our website, we made a mini documentary called Distant Waters that kind of provides a more in-depth overview of that entire campaign. But some of the stuff that we saw on board was, was shocking. So ships were broadcasting multiple electronic identification numbers from the same ship, um, which... So, you know, it's kind of hard to tell who that is and where they are, um, or they'd be broadcasting numbers that didn't match up to the actual ship. So one, one ship was broadcasting, indicating that it was a search and rescue aircraft, when in fact it was an industrial fishing ship, um, which is an indication that there might be some suspicious activity going on, right? And the thing with these ships as well, too, is that they can remain out at sea for several years at a time without docking, um, which 
brings up issues relating to human rights concerns as well as environmental concerns um, and possible slave labor as well too. So um, one uh, on one of the vessels, an Indonesian crew member attempted to communicate with our crew, particularly when he found out that we had American press on board and he was telling them that he wanted to go home. And he asked, this was last summer, he asked whether COVID had reached the United States yet. So that gives you an indication of how long this man had been on board without any access to external communications. My gosh. Yeah, it's a whole other aspect of this conversation. Exactly. That is so crucial. Um, I watched that documentary and I remember that man saying, I want to go home. And the Sea Shepherd crew saying, are you all right? Are you all right? And him saying, you know, essentially, they are, it's slave labor, yeah. as you said. And Oh my gosh, just the idea of being out at sea for that long without docking. The mental health implications for anybody are pretty... It's it's terrifying stuff. It really is terrifying stuff. And again, but it really, it speaks to the importance of ground truthing is kind of like the buzzword for it, but actually having boots on the ground and somebody actually being there, you know, like on the surface with the signals that are being sent out, maybe everything looks great, but without actually having ships in the water to see what's going on, like we really don't know what's going on out there. We collectively, you know? Yeah. And you know, that brings up a point for me that it almost is like this whole movement is ground truthing in a way. I mean, the films like Sea Spiracy and Cow Spiracy, if you want to talk about animal agriculture on land and films that feature Sea Shepherd, the work that Sea Shepherd is doing, it's all in a sense, ground truthing. It's all these things that are going on outside of our awareness so much of the time. And so anything that is bringing transparency, visibility into what's actually happening behind our supply chains, legal and illegal, frankly, is so important now so that we can act from an informed place. Because otherwise we just think, oh, you know, great, a whole pack of shrimp for it's so cheap. And we don't even think about why it's so cheap or where it came from or what was involved in getting it to us. And, you know, without these efforts to sort of (laughs) ground truth the industry as well as these illegal fishing vessels i mean we don't know so yeah it's just crucial and it's all connected i mean i i can remember distinctly standing on the shores of taiji in japan with ali from seaspiracy you know day after day we'd watch this bloody massacre and try to make sense of the why not even sure if there is a why that could possibly, you know, justify this you know and and then connecting it to the massive overfishing tuna fleet or tuna port, you know, one town over, you know, there, there are consequences sometimes extending beyond what the consumer could even possibly, you know, imagine, you know, the loss of one species is, or the depletion of one species, the overfishing of one species leading to, you know, the mass slaughter of dolphins. It's cause and effect. Yeah. And it just speaks even more to the importance of, increasing our awareness and sort of accepting nothing less than change, you know, making the change ourselves and those choices that we have and then going bigger and working within our communities to raise awareness and then doing everything we can to step in between these practices and advocate for a better path before we say goodbye to more and more species as we've been speaking about. Hi, everyone. We're going to break here and bring you more of our conversation with Tamara of Sea Shepherd, as well as our post-interview wrap-up, takeaways, challenge, and what you can do to make an impact today in part two, which we'll release in two weeks. We covered so much ground with Tamara that we felt it deserved two parts so that you can really take in what we've learned and heard so far and then be ready for more in a couple weeks Tune in to part two to learn more about how massive illegal fishing has become and how every consumer throughout the world is directly involved, why the health of the ocean is crucial to the health of the planet, the best and the worst that Tamara has seen during her time on the open oceans, and what we can all do to be part of the solution. We look forward to sharing part two with you soon. It's time to change the world. It's time for something better. 
We are telling the stories of people who are changing the world and how you can help. Our daily actions have a massive impact, so what will we do about it? We can remake the world, because guess what? We can. Hi everyone, I'm Nathan Gardner and this is We Can Remake the World, a podcast about people who are changing the world and how you can help. Welcome to part two of our conversation with Tamara Arenovich, head of media and communications for the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. If you missed part one two weeks ago, we would definitely recommend listening prior to jumping into today's part two episode, where we'll dig deeper into how Sea Shepherd is protecting global oceans and marine ecosystems, why that matters so much, and what all of us can do to be part of healing our oceans and our planet. Thanks for being here with us. Let's get back to our conversation with Tamara. Uh, one question I wanted to ask Tamara was just, I didn't realize how prevalent IUU fishing is, this problem of illegal fishing and this lack of transparency and oversight, which I guess makes sense if you think about it out on the open ocean, but it's a huge problem. And I just wanted to ask you to speak about, you know, what's going on out there? Why is this such a problem? And how does Sea Shepherd play a role in managing it and controlling it? Um, well, it's a good question. It is an enormous issue, and it's one that hasn't received the attention that perhaps it deserves. Um, our oceans, of course, are incredibly important to the well-being of our entire planet and the survival of all species, including ourselves. Um, and protecting our oceans is essential to, you know, protecting our planet and ultimately our future as well, too. Um, the oceans, of course, are responsible for over 50% of the oxygen we breathe, they are home to a vast array of marine animals that um, that thrive in a very delicate ecosystem and ultimately help to mitigate climate change, provide our oxygen and so forth. So I can't really understate, um, I can't really overstate rather how important it is to protect the oceans. Um, but our ocean is in trouble right now and there's a number of threats that are really threatening the ocean's ability to do its job, um, one of them being climate change, another one being plastic pollution, a third one being illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, these are just a few of the many threats that our, our ocean is currently facing, and they're not entirely independent either, for that matter. So there's definitely an interplay between those. As far as IUU fishing goes, this is an enormous problem um, that spans, you know, like all corners of the oceans and the most delicate and rich ecosystems are particularly vulnerable. So IUU fishing is an enormous threat that faces our oceans and it's largely because of overfishing and irresponsible fishing practices. Um, over 2.7 trillion fish are caught every year, which corresponds <laughs> to, yeah, which is up to 5 million fish every minute. So I can't really grasp numbers of that magnitude in my own mind. I don't know that any of us can. Um, but essentially, it's a volume that is not sustainable, which is why we are seeing so many species being pushed to the brink of extinction right now, which is why we're losing so many species right now, which is why we have a staggering number of species on the IUCN red list that are threatened with extinction at the moment. This, of course, also interferes with the delicate balance of the ocean oceanic ecosystems, which, you know, every species that exists in the ocean exists there for a reason and plays an important role in um, ensuring the health of our world's oceans. We, an alarming number of species are endangered right now. I can tell you that of those fishing nets that are being put into the sea, studies estimate that approximately 40% of all marine wildlife that is caught is caught as bycatch, which is not the intended species that's being targeted, but rather accidental catch of other species that it can include things like sharks, dolphins, whales, sea turtles that are caught purely accidentally and often lose their lives in the process. And we're seeing the results of that right now. Um, over 100 million sharks are killed every year, either intentionally or unintentionally. That is up to 30,000 sharks being killed every hour. Um, six sharks six sharks are killed every second. So it gives you a sense, just, um, you know, this is an animal that a lot of people have a hard time empathizing with. It doesn't have the best PR team and many people are frightened of sharks, but 
uh, for scale, you know, on average, 10 people are killed in shark attacks every year, and which is often a case of mistaken identity and also sharks being forced to go into waters where humans exist because their food sources have been depleted due to overfishing and illegal fishing. So we're really seeing a crisis situation where some of these most iconic animals, you know, that are just like the hammerhead shark, for example, is critically endangered now. Um, their populations have declined by 80 to 90, 90 per, 80 to 99% in the last two decades. Shark populations are going extinct because of us. Um, and it's not just sharks. Bluefin tuna, for example, um, only 3% of bluefin tuna populations remain now. This is an endangered animal that sells for exorbitantly high prices due to human demand. Um, Six out of the seven species of sea turtles that exist are currently threatened with extinction. The seventh isn't necessarily getting a free pass either. It's just data deficient. We actually don't have enough information to assess how many there actually are out there. So this, you can get a sense of the scope of this problem. It's an enormous problem. And part of the problem, I think, is that the sheer volume of the ocean makes it really difficult or impossible, even with political will, to, to monitor all of these areas simultaneously and take out the bad actors. Now, we at Sea Shepherd have had a great deal of success and continue to work closely with governments in key areas. You know, these are national waters where laws exist to protect protect marine life, to protect the ecosystems, but often it's a matter of resources in order to be able to actually properly enforce those laws. So we work with a number of um, governments around the world in some of the richest, most biodiverse ecosystems to help them to enforce existing laws, to identify these bad actors and get them out of the water for good. Another key component in addressing this problem is the establishment and maintenance of marine protected areas. So these are areas in which ideally no fishing at all is allowed and limited traffic is allowed. These rich biodiverse areas allow marine life the opportunity to, to recover, you know, to just rest, relax, breed, populations to grow and expand. I've had the privilege to be in a few of these amazing areas and to dive under their waters and it's um breathtaking. It brought tears to my eyes. It's what the oceans were always supposed to look like, and it's what they once looked like. Um, and the beauty of this is by protecting these areas, not only are we protecting and enhancing the health of these areas, but as populations grow and thrive, they will expand outside of the protected regions, enhancing the health of the oceans at large. So it really is important that we protect these areas, that we establish more protected areas that are aligned with the actual natural behavior of marine wildlife. So migratory species, for example, such as sharks and whales, it's great to protect them in these areas where they're known to frequent, but if they're not protected throughout their migratory journeys, you know, whether they're caught legally or otherwise outside of those zones, um, you know, it, it's somewhat all for nothing. So there's a lot of work to be done there. We have a lot of great partnerships and we're proud of uh, many of the victories that we've had in that area, but there is so much more to do um, for our clients, which are ultimately the sharks and the turtles and the whales. And this is who we're accountable to at the end of the day. Yeah, something you said just sparked an idea for me that I hadn't had, which is, it's almost like if we're trying to protect the elephant in a very at risk area from I know poaching is not as much of a problem these days, but just from many of the human threats that are involved, we say, okay, this little square area of, you know, 50 kilometers squared, the elephants are protected. But anywhere else, uh, all bets are off. You know, that's exactly. kind of almost what we're doing with uh, the marine protected areas are a wonderful initiative. It's it's something we must do and we must continue to grow them. But you make such a good point that these animals aren't, they don't know what the boundary of a marine protected area is. They're following their own natural patterns. And, you know, it really takes an organization like Sea Shepherd or or governments who have the resources to stand up and actually protect these creatures because, you know, as we've seen, illegal fishing will just undermine any effort we take otherwise. That's exactly it. I mean, borders are inherently artificial, aren't they? And a shark does, or a fish doesn't know the difference between, you know, this this bit of water and that bit of water that's on the other side of the border. It's nor does an elephant, you know. So it's it's absolutely essential that we continue continue to expand those protections beyond those borders. But as you say, it's a, it's a good and it's a necessary first step.
Another yeah. thing that we do is work with a number of scientific collaborators who are monitoring and maintaining data on the health of these areas as well, too, which is important because it provides the actual facts and figures to establish how effective these regulations and policies actually are. And if we can mm -hmm. demonstrate that they're effective, um, you know, this allows I guess, the ammunition needed to maintain those protections and to potentially expand them in a way that is more naturalistic and that helps the animals that, that use those areas. Yeah. There's another question that I want to ask you, and I, I don't know, I'd just be curious to hear a reaction. Why is an organization like Sea Shepherd necessary in this world? Like, Why aren't governments or enforcing bodies or United Nations group or something, why, why isn't somebody doing a better job of enforcing the protections that are in existence or the historical uh, agreements that have been made that even territorial waters I know in my research to prepare to speak with you are being violated? Like, why is it so easy for these actors, these vessels to carry out illegal fishing operations other than the sort of difficulty and oversight and, and you know, enforcement just from the sheer size of the ocean, you know, is it, is it a lack of will, do you think, or is it, why do you think an organization like Sea Shepherd is so crucial to enforce these laws? You know, why isn't someone else doing a better job uh, of doing it so that people didn't have to take it into their own hands in a sense, which I'm so glad they did. And Sea Shepherd is doing incredible work, but it's like Sea Shepherd should have all the help out there. Don't like, it seems like. Well, um, you know, Nathan, why are activists necessary? Why, you know, why isn't the government solving all of the world's problems? I don't have an answer to that question, but I do know that having additional voices and additional resources out there raising awareness and saying that this is not okay and we need to do more, that is inherently how progress happens, you know? women's rights, human rights, animal rights, environmental protections, every one of us plays a role in standing up and saying that this is not okay, the status quo must change, and also putting pressure on our respective governments to take these issues seriously. Yeah, no, I got chills. It's the perfect answer, I think, you know, and I'm so glad that Sea Shepherd is out there, not just standing physically between these illegal vessels and their you know, illegal activities, but also just using media as a tool and getting involved with as many documentaries and, and to, you know, as many media resources as possible. I think the organization has been so smart and so effective at that, just to raise awareness and bring people into the conversation where there is so little visibility and oversight. And I'm just so glad that Sea Shepherd is out there. I think a lot of people feel that way. I've um, said it before, um, and I'll say it again too, you know, it's my personal take, but I really, in spite of it all, do believe that people are inherently good. And <laughs> And, and I don't think that there's anything particularly special about me other than that I've had the privilege to be out there on the front lines on numerous occasions and experience the best and the worst of humanity. I really truly believe that anybody else having had these opportunities would make the same decisions that I have. You know, it, the vaquita, for example, this obscure little animal in some tiny little pocket of water in Mexico seems so far away and it's something that realistically most people will never see in their lifetime so theoretically it would be nice to protect it but it just doesn't seem real on some level but i can assure you it's real i've been there i've seen them you know and and as you know a crew member and as media on board i just can't emphasize the importance of that enough i i wish i truly do wish that i could bring every single person on board so that they could see this firsthand and i think that the world we live in would be a very different place and i think the conversation we're having would be a very different conversation. It's not possible to do that. But Captain Paul Watson, our founder, has always recognized the power of the camera. It is our most powerful weapon. We do our best to take you there because I think given armed with the facts, the visuals, the information, people ultimately will make the right choices. Yeah, I think you're right. I think so many people just don't know. They just don't have insight. They don't know. They're not exposed to the facts. The sort of mainstream media doesn't always do such a great job of highlighting these stories on any kind of consistent basis, putting voices like Paul, Captain Paul Watson or other representatives of Sea Shepherd in the forefront to, to 
alert people to the urgency of this, the volume of life being taken out of the ocean and the jeopardy that we're all in as a global community because of that. And yeah, I I think you're right. I think if more people knew, change would happen much more quickly, which is why, you know, we do this show. It's why I think Sea Shepherd has made a point to get involved with all the different documentaries and and all the ways that it can to to spread the word and invite people to the conversation so that they can make an informed choice. And would you speak maybe just about any examples of past successes that Sea Shepherd has had? I know we've spoken about several ongoing campaigns that are super important and a lot of current partnerships that I think are bearing a lot of fruit. But um, I'd love to hear just any campaigns that jump out at you as far as, you know, really clear successes where Sea Shepherd has been able to really, you know, make a true difference by doing what they do. Well, I think the most iconic one would really be the one that kind of started, you know, the the one that people are most familiar for about Sea Shepherd from, which is like the whale wars era in the Southern <laughs> Ocean. So, you know, Sea Shepherd for a number of years was out in the Southern Ocean protecting whales in the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary against illegal whaling that was taking place um, from Japanese fishing boats. So we battled that one for many, many years. It was well documented. And 2019 marked the first year where no whaling actually occurred in the Southern Whale Ocean Sanctuary. Sea Shepherd has opposed Japanese whaling operations in the Southern Ocean since 2002 and through direct action has saved the lives of over 6,000 whales from the harpoons of whalers. Now, despite a global ban on commercial whaling, Japan had slaughtered whales in the Southern Ocean for decades under the pretext of scientific research. Uh, The International Court of Justice deemed that this research was non-scientific and, in fact, illegal. So in 2019, Japan announced an end to their Arctic whaling program, and no whales were killed in the Southern Whale Ocean Sanctuary from that point forward. So the whale wars are now officially over, and we won. And that's a huge win for our clients. Yeah, it's awesome. I think I read, too, that uh, Captain Paul Watson said that now this means also that there's no whaling going on in the Southern Hemisphere at all. That's hugely encouraging. Indeed. And whales are so important, not only because they're living beings and they're magical and they're mystical and, you know, they're so intelligent. And if you've ever had the privilege of seeing one, it's a life changing experience. But whales, as is the case with all marine wildlife, play such a critical role in maintaining, again, the health of the oceans and also mitigating climate change. These animals sequester carbon and in, you know, traveling from the bottom of the ocean up into the top, they do an incredible job of you know, spreading nutrients throughout the water column. All of this is so important in, you know, mitigating climate change and sequestering carbon. So it really is important that we protect these animals, not only because they are living creatures that deserve to exist peacefully in their natural habitat, but again, it's one of those things that protect the planet. It's in all of our best interests. Yeah. And the whales contribute to the health of phytoplankton, which are the producers of the oxygen that we breathe. And it's yet another example of this theme that comes up on our show all the time of you cannot separate one piece of the whole. Everything plays a role. Everything is part of the system that we enjoy on this earth. And, you know, to pretend like any one member of the community is not necessary or not vital is not just short-sighted, but dangerous and becoming more and more so. Absolutely. So it sounds like several of these examples are due to markets which are possibly illegal. Are there examples where Sea Shepherd is working to protect waters where, you know, consumers throughout the world are sort of indirectly involved as consumers? You know, are, are there are there is there illegal fishing going on that makes its way into a market that, you know, we could see take shape in like a Canadian supermarket, an American supermarket, a German supermarket? You know, how how should the average consumer listening to this react to how this is impacting choices that they make every day, too, as far as the products they buy? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the whole um, supply chain of like illegal versus legally caught fish is not as well defined as it should be. So is there the possibility that, you know, that that a fish that you may purchase in a supermarket in Europe or North America came from illegal uh, fishing activities? The answer is yes, that's a possibility. Um, So really the best that you can do as a consumer, I guess, is to, to make conscious choices to reduce the amount of seafood and fish that you eat whenever possible, eliminate it altogether if possible. 
you know, the, the, the fish farming that we see off the coast of British Columbia and Canada and other areas of the world has an enormous impact on, you know, wild caught salmon and local ecosystems. It's often, you know, promoted as a, as a, environmentally friendly alternative to eating wild caught fish because these are farmed fish. But the reality is that, you know, they're, it's factory farming, albeit in the ocean um, and not on land. But these animals are living in incredibly cramped and unhealthy conditions. Disease is rife, um, parasites, illness, and all of that waste product and all of that disease spills out into the ocean ecosystems, which has an impact on wild am- animals as well, too. So truly, I mean, if at all possible, avoid and reduce the consumption of marine wildlife. It's the best possible thing you can do for your health and also for the health of the oceans. What is your dog's name? My dog's name is Tinka. I'm sorry about the barking. Tinka. No, it's okay. Sounds like she agrees. That's all I was going to say. So I found her um, when she was uh, a puppy in Mexico and I kind of just took her. So had her for a few years now. She's lucky. She's a good girl. Um, yeah. You know, the ocean seems, yeah. has an, an incredible ability to heal um, if we just let it rest. But, you know, the, the scope and the magnitude of the overfishing that's happening right now is really stretching and stressing populations to the absolute limit. They can recover. They can come back. They can bounce back and we'll all be better for it if we can just alleviate some of that pressure. So as consumers, we have enormous power with the, you know, with the purchases that we, that we choose to make and the purchases that we choose not to make. Yeah. It seems like there's almost no good way to provide seafood to the world at the level at which it's demanded, you know, these days. So it really is about reducing or eliminating your consumption of these living beings because there's really no good way to do it anymore not in this world not with the mindset of industrial farming applied to the oceans and you can't really get some shrimp in a restaurant or some sushi in you know denver without enormous cost to our ecosystems and our the health of our planet as a result i think at least that's my sense after watching these stories play out so often over the last 10 years or so, you know, you really just can't ignore it once you've seen it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it it goes a step beyond that as well, too. We're facing a time now where our planet is under enormous stress. You know, we're starting to see um, stories about, you know, climate change unfold in the regular. And, um, you know, like the, the, the planet is, is, is struggling right now. And we call our planet earth, but it really is planet ocean. So over 70% of the earth's surface is covered with water. You know, if you take a breath, take a second breath, one of those two breaths just came to you courtesy of the ocean. Over 50%, 50 to 80% of the oxygen that we breathe is provided from the ocean. And this has everything to do with that delicate balance of an oceanic ecosystem that I had mentioned earlier it's it's the life in the ocean and the interaction of life forms within the ocean that ultimately produces um, the oxygen that we breathe and also serves as a carbon sink to help mitigate the impact of climate change. So a healthy ocean is absolutely essential for a healthy planet. And we really cannot talk about you know environmentalism or climate change or any of these things without bringing in you know, the ocean, 70% of our planet is water and that has to be healthy for the planet to be healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Like people might say, oh, why does the vaquita matter? Why do sharks off of the coast of Western Africa matter? Well, it's part of the larger picture of the health of the oceans. One species being unhealthy is a symptom of an ecosystem being unhealthy, which is a symptom of the earth in pockets and now more and more throughout the planet becoming unhealthy. And, you know, we have to have this holistic perspective, even while we work on the micro level, very close in local communities to make change where we can and how we can, I think. We all have a we all have a role to play essentially in helping to protect the oceans. So collaboration is a big part of what we're doing these days. Um, many of our scientific 
partnerships as well, too, or our scientific campaigns are in partnership and really just elevating and enhancing the efforts of, um, of uh, conservation researchers around the world. So this is absolutely important. As I mentioned earlier, the oceans can recover if we give them the opportunity to heal. So it really is a collaborative effort between governments, between activists, between individuals, um, between scientists to, with our respective lenses, work together to actually generate a solution that ultimately works in a manner that that makes sense for the way that marine wildlife actually behaves. Yeah, that's such a good point. And something you were speaking about earlier, I think is important to call out as far as globally, some of these illegal fishing vessels are violating national boundaries too. And taking away from, I assume, local farmers who may depend on the health of ecosystems for food sources to sustain their families. And would you speak maybe just a little bit more about some of the partnerships that have taken shape with governments in, you know, South America, Mexico and Central America, North America, um, and then also Western Africa. So, yeah, absolutely. You've, you've made an excellent point there. And we definitely do see that this illegal fishing, not only is it devastating to the environment, but it also has very real human impacts as well, too, for local economies, local communities. Sea Shepherd works collaboratively with governments around the world, um, including governments in Liberia, Namibia, Sao Tome and Principe, the Gambia, Benin, Gabon, Sierra Leone, Mexico, Peru, Panama and discussions are currently underway to work um, to uh, build up additional government partnerships as well. Hmm. I can certainly tell you um, from having spent many years on on Milagro, for example, in Mexico, that, uh, you know, the Vaquita Refuge is really just off the shore of a small fishing village. Um, this is historically a fishing village where local artisanal fishermen, you know, catch their fish and feed their families as they've done for many generations. And, um, you know, when the black market came into town and the cartel came into town and people started fishing for Totoaba swim bladders. You know, this has a devastating impact, as you can imagine, for local communities and, and, and families, as well as, you know, what it's doing to the Vaquita. Um, so that I think it's worth mentioning that in this particular instance, the poachers that we're, you know, that we are opposing here are, are not the local fishermen. We do not oppose the local efforts by artisanal fishermen. They're also victims of this whole situation. And I mean, it's, it's a tough situation to solve, um, you know, but a healthy ocean will also enhance the health of local artisanal fishing communities as well, too. So um, I I think it's, um, you know, like well-intentioned efforts, so like shrimp embargoes against the fishing that's going on, you know, in the upper Gulf of California penalizes local legal shrimp fishermen and forces them mm -hmm. out of the waters, which in turn leaves the waters wide open for the cartel. So hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's harming people that are potentially um, allies to help protect this region who have, you know, a vested effort in protecting this region um, that are not necessarily the same ones that are responsible for poaching and killing um, the Totoaba and the Vaquita. Yeah, such a good point. You know, you just reminded me of a question I wanted to ask earlier. Is there... I mean, you mentioned the cartel in Mexico is one example. I would imagine that some of these other illegal fishing vessels are, you know, not the friendliest folks. So uh, is there risk involved for Sea Shepherd vessels? And, you know, has Sea Shepherd had to understand how to protect itself as well in this work as it really is kind of a vigilante operation in some ways, or at least historically has been? Uh, there's certainly risk involved. I mean, the stakes are high and uh, it's been well documented and, you know, in some of the films that are out there that feature our work, but um, there's big money and, and, you know, a lot at stake for the people that, that oppose what we're doing out there. Um, we are not armed, you know, we are, we are merely defending ourselves out there, but, you know, like um, from our early days on Operation Milagro, where we had a single sailboat out there, it's it's evolved into something a little bit more than that. Um, I mean, there's no shortage of footage out there that shows our ships getting attacked. Um, poachers have swarmed our ships. They've launched Molotov cocktails at us. They've shot at us. They've set our ships on fire. They've 
they've illegally boarded our ship. So um, we do have defensive measures in place to to ensure the safety of our volunteers and our crew on board. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's it can be dangerous out there at times. <laughs> if you'd be willing, I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about sort of what you've seen out there as far as what you think of as the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. You know, what are what's sort of something inspiring and beautiful that comes to mind for you? And then also maybe what's something that was really hard to take in? Well, it's it's interesting and it's a bit emotional for me because the two are so closely interconnected. Mm-hmm. I think experiencing the best and the worst of humanity at the same time is is uh, somewhat commonplace to me, and it's and it's complicated to work through emotionally. Um, I can tell you in Japan when I was in Taiji, for example. Um, there really aren't any words to describe what it's like to watch the systematic slaughter of multi-generational families of highly intelligent cetaceans, obje- objectively animals that are more intelligent than us, even by our own stack deck definition of intelligence, their <laughs> brains are so much more evolved than us. And, and the horror and the atrocity that they experience and that, you know, that I witnessed there is just, um, you know, we've we've seen the cove, we've seen it in Seaspiracy, and and these documentaries did an excellent job of shedding light on this atrocity that's still underway. But it's not the same as being there. I can tell you that. And uh, without getting too graphic, uh, well, okay, I'll get graphic. But I mean, you can hear them screaming. You can you can smell the blood in the water. This is all so senseless. You know, you watch them like trying to jump up on the rocks just to end their own suffering and getting thrown back down. And you know, like it's it's kind of indescribable and over overwhelming for a lot of people. Um, and at the same time, you've got people there, you know, from all around the world who've taken, who are voluntarily witnessing this and sharing this with the world. And not only people like myself, you know, North Americans, but what was really inspiring to me are the incredibly courageous Japanese activists who have so much more at stake by mm-hmm. being there and documenting this and, and you know, potentially working with us than, than we could ever really understand as an incredible amount of selflessness and courage. And, and it's incredibly commendable. So, You know, on one hand, you see these dead eyed, you know, like fishermen going out and just committing the most horrible atrocities, you know, like killing pods of dolphins, separating babies from their mothers and kind of having the audacity to look bored while they're doing it. And on the flip side, you've got people on the shores who are risking their lives and their families, you know, well-beings to 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 tell the world about this. So. um, So, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. It's heavy, you know, and and. um, on the ships, for another example, again, I can tell you, having spent many years out in the upper Gulf of California on Operation Milagro, you know, at times it does feel hopeless when you're pulling in these, you know, like dead animals, so many dead animals, animals that we couldn't save that are bycatch entangled in illegal fishing gear that's placed in the water entirely due to human greed and, you know, unsubstantiated medicinal purposes where, you know, people are, you know, like basically profiting off the extinction of species. That's, that's atrocious and it's appalling and it, and it becomes, it, it, it is a lot to, to take, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and then I look around me at the amazing group of crew members, you know, colleagues on the shores and on the ships that are working with me, largely volunteers, you know, from all walks of life all around the world who are here fighting this fight. Um, I'm incredibly inspired by them. Um, And I'm just reminded that, you know, there are people out there that care deeply and that are fighting for a better world. I'll tell you just as a sort of like side example on that, one of the little initiatives we've been doing in preparation for World Oceans Day at Sea Shepherd is we just uh, did a little coloring contest for kids, ask them to submit drawings of their favorite marine life and for a chance to win a prize. And we were reviewing all of the entries. And it's remarkable to me that I'm seeing, you know, little kids in, in Europe who are sending us pictures of vaquitas and gillnets and totoabas. Oh, yeah. and, and I'm like, that's, that's us, you know, like this is like a child in a small town in Hungary who knows about the plight of the totoaba and the vaquita because, because we put that story out there. And I think that's to be commended and that kid may play an integral role in actually solving this problem in the future. So. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Perfect. Well, I think the last thing I'd like to ask today, Tamara, is just um, what have you learned as far as the importance of 
getting involved and taking a stand from working with Sea Shepherd. I think Sea Shepherd is such a clear example of people saying we must do something here. And so we're going to do it and we're going to do whatever it takes while still respecting the safety of other human beings and, uh, you know, the international law that protects us all from a common sense sort of perspective. But Sea Shepherd really does everything they can to make a difference. And I'd love to hear you just speak about the power of that and and your experience of what it feels like to truly take a stand and and what we can all learn from what you've experienced in that sense. I think what I've learned ultimately is that there's the power of the individual to truly make a difference. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, that in the end is probably one of the only things that actually does make a difference is a small group of committed, passionate individuals working towards something that they truly do believe in. Every one of us has the capacity to bring forth change. Every one of us, the people that are out there on the front lines, the people that you saw in whale wars, the people that you saw in seaspiracy, these are people, you know, they're just like you or me, people who've made a choice to get out there and make a difference. And as small or as large as that choice can be, um, it's better than the alternative of doing nothing because nothing will change if nothing ever happens, right? So I think any contribution, no matter how great or small, is commendable and honorable and is worthwhile. So yes, it's sometimes it requires a bit of sacrifice. Sometimes, you know, you may look at this and say, I can't volunteer to be on the ships for three months. I've got, you know, whatever school or I've got a mortgage or whatever. You know, not everybody can. I appreciate that. But there's plenty of things you can do locally within within your own community to get involved and to help. You can contribute financially to these causes if you're in a, in, in a means where you're able to do that. You know, we are entirely... Um, based on donations. We're a nonprofit organization, so all donations are greatly appreciated. You know, get involved in whatever capacity you can. It really does matter. And in fact, at the end of the day, perhaps it's the only thing that does matter, right? It's, it's really trying to leave the world a little bit better of a place than, than how we found it. Yeah. And I love, I saw a quote recently from, from Captain Watson, actually, of Sea Shepherd, where he said, you know, it's no longer about even being optimistic. It's not about if the activists win. It's about, you know, are we going to do what it takes to save humanity, essentially? Not, of course, the wildlife, of course, nature, of course, all the beautiful life on this planet. But are we willing to do what it takes to save ourselves? And, you know, every choice someone makes to do something that preserves and protects life is in that camp, is is growing that version of the world. It's it's changing the story so that we're no longer hopeless or doomed or inevitably self-destructive. It's like, no, if, if every single person who makes a small choice, a large choice, any choice to preserve and protect life is part of the answer to that, is part of the solution. And Absolutely. And it's part of the collective consciousness too. Every action that you put out there, as large or small as it might be, somebody's watching it, you know, some, some kid somewhere might be listening to your podcast, Nathan, and that might give them the courage or the push that they need to go off and do something that neither you or I could even have conceptualized, but maybe, you know, the solution moving forward. So I think, you know, by setting a good example for our fellow men and, you know, extending a hand and, and leading the way together, we can all make this world a better place. Yeah, it goes back to that point of we're all connected and we all have different roles to play, just like nature does. Every every being has its own role to play. So do we as humans, you know, in, in our way. Um, perfect. Well, thanks again, Tamara. This was really wonderful speaking with you and such a privilege to hear uh, about your individual experiences and to learn more about Sea Shepherd. Truly a pleasure. Thank you so much, Nathan. I'm so glad Tamara spoke about the amazing accomplishment of Sea Shepherd in the Southern Atlantic near Antarctica, which is a victory for the entire Southern Hemisphere. Sea Shepherd prevented Japanese whaling vessels from continuing to operate in the dark, without accountability, without transparency, without having to answer to the international community for the deceit that they were using to cover up the capture and murder of whales, which they said was research. Sea Shepherd refused to allow the Japanese vessels to operate in the dark, and that was enough. They didn't have to stop them completely on their own, and they didn't have to find ways to force them legally or politically to stop. They just had to be there. 
to be the eyes for the world, to get in the way of these operations physically so that attention was called to the situation and so that the pressure from a public relations standpoint was so large that it was enough to put a stop to it for the Japanese organizations who were involved. This illustrates a point we've explored this year a few times with other guests, that visibility is one of the most important tools we have to protect our planet and ourselves. Corporations are terrified that the global population will find out what's going on behind closed doors, behind the four walls of an industrial farming facility, behind the closed doors of a boardroom, in the remote forests that are being destroyed, or out at sea where nobody's watching. The greatest power these organizations have when it comes to continuing their exploitation of people and planet is based on deceit and secrecy, which means that our greatest tools in stopping them are truth and transparency. We must make a point to support organizations like Sea Shepherd and so many other nonprofits and NGOs around the world who are focused on shining a light on those who are operating in the dark who are doing the work of uncovering the truth and sharing it fearlessly with the world, despite often personal cost. Because when the truth is known, so much can change and quickly. All that power, all that money, all that influence can't cause people to forget what they now know once they know it. And that is massively powerful. Which takes us to our three takeaways for today's episode, what we call our three changemakers. Changemaker number one. We are more powerful than we realize. The Sea Shepherd organization is made up of a small community of people, but look at what they've been able to accomplish on the global stage. They have affected the behavior of massive and powerful governments and interests with endless resources, like the government of Japan, the industries of Japan. There are very obvious limits to the true influence of money and secrecy when we see stories like this. These interests, which seem so powerful, fall apart very quickly when truth, humanity, and accountability enter the picture. Humanity in the sense of compassion and acknowledging of what's best for us and other living things. Typically, at any time, there are roughly 100 to 120 individual volunteers working out at sea on Sea Shepherd vessels. That's around the entire planet. This fleet of vessels that numbers in the single digits is standing between massive political and financial interests and protecting marine life on a huge scale. Imagine what Sea Shepherd could do with 100 vessels, 10 times the amount they have now, which isn't very many when we remember that the commercial fishing industry has about 5 million vessels around the world's oceans. It's so easy to look at the problems of the world and feel small and insignificant or helpless due to the sheer scale of what's going on. But when we step up and do something about it and find ways to appeal to the hearts and minds of others around the world, we are powerful, more powerful than we ever would have guessed. I think what Tamara said during our conversation is so true. When people understand the problem and what to do to solve it, when it becomes real to them, they'll often choose to protect and preserve life. If enough of us stand up to these global interests who are taking advantage of our ignorance and our hopelessness and then share the truth of what they're doing with others, this world can transform so quickly. We've got to do what we can to tell and share these stories. Which brings us to changemaker number two. When we take a stand, we can transform the world. And if we don't take a stand, we will lose the world as we know it. Remember when Tamara answered the question about why organizations like Sea Shepherd are necessary? She responded by asking, why are activists ever necessary? Women's rights, civil rights, LGBTQ plus rights, none of these were handed to the groups who fought for them. All of the progress that was made to liberate and build equality for every marginalized group of non-white, non-male, non-heterosexual peoples came from communities that stood together and stood up to power demanding change. And each of these communities changed the world for themselves and for all of us who came after. When we take a stand as Sea Shepherd is doing, as so many other conservation-focused organizations and communities are doing, we can transform the world for the better. The difference with this topic is that if we don't take a stand for the earth and for our oceans, we will lose our way of life forever. If we lose the balance of the ocean's ecosystems because we've harvested trillions of fish every year until they can no longer replenish themselves, causing the deaths of countless other ocean creatures— 
then the oceans begin to die, and we lose the source of half of our oxygen. This is the reality of our time. If we continue to ignore the truth that consuming animals at the volumes that we currently do is destroying our Earth and our ability to inhabit it, then we will lose it, and we won't get a do-over. Which is why it's so important to take action that lines up with the truth of our situation. We must make a stand, or forever regret that we didn't. Which takes us to change maker number three. We must take our hope and make it active. Organizations like Sea Shepherd give me hope. It's so encouraging to know that there are groups of people out there putting their lives on hold and their safety at risk to protect the most precious resources on our planet on behalf of all of us. But without my taking my own action, that hope goes no further. The hope that grew out of me seeing Sea Shepherd in action kind of dies on the vine. I need to do what I can do to support organizations like Sea Shepherd and what they stand for, and then also become a conduit for change in whatever way I can, whatever way we can. And we may not change the world overnight, of course. We need more and more voices in this conversation to really turn the tide if we're going to make and see meaningful change. But we don't get involved and make our individual stand to get immediate results. We do it because it keeps that hope alive and gives life to the solutions that are available to us to keep us going, to keep us moving. As I was reading about Sea Shepherd to prepare today's episode, I came across a story that Captain Paul Watson, Sea Shepherd's founder, told during an interview. A story about a defining moment in his life and in his work as a protector and advocate for the Earth. Captain Watson spent time at Wounded Knee in South Dakota, during the 1973 occupation of that location, which is the same place where the 1890 massacre happened, where almost 300 Lakota Native Americans, including men, women, and children, were killed by the United States Army. If you aren't familiar with either the massacre of 1890 or the 1973 occupation, I would definitely encourage you to spend a moment looking it up online. There's this huge piece of American history when it comes to Native American relations that none of us have heard about in school. And we need to. We need to be talking about it. In 1973, the United States Marshal Service, the FBI, and local law enforcement opened fire on the occupiers of Wounded Knee, who were mostly Native Americans, and their supporters during this action, which lasted for 71 days. Captain Watson was serving as a medic for the American Indian Movement, or AIM, which is an organization that was sponsoring a lot of the action. Captain Watson has shared in interviews what he observed as far as the Lakota mindset when it came to this occupation and other acts of resistance and civil disobedience that the Native Americans were carrying out. This is a quote from Captain Watson describing what he observed in the Lakota. You don't do what you do and worry about whether you're going to win or lose. You do what you do because it's the right thing to do, and therefore it is the only thing to do. You can't be concerned about the results. You can't be concerned about the odds against you. You just do what you have to do. The interviewer had asked Captain Watson if he gets hopeless or discouraged about the success or failure of global activism. And his response was, it's not important if activists win or lose. It's important whether the human species survives or not. We must take action. We must find reasons to believe in what we stand for and let that be enough because there will be big challenges and there will be disappointing outcomes, but we've got to keep going. We may begin to lose precious species forever, both on land and at sea, if we don't change soon. We must continue to stand anyway. We may not see the mainstream adopt these stories and inspire people to become more aware, to take action. We, who have chosen to do so, must continue to stand anyway. We may not see people make the connection that consuming animals is destroying our planet, and we may lose crucial ecosystems in the process. We must continue to stand anyway, and to do our best to make people aware of the choice that they have to benefit the planet. We cannot control the outcomes, the beliefs or behaviors of others, but we can do what must be done because it preserves our ability to live as we do now, and that can be enough for us. We must make our hope active. We must take action. 
It's not about winning or even being right or justified in the eyes of others. It's about doing what we have to do. We don't take action to win quickly or show off. We do it because it's the right thing to do, and we must do all we can. So that if nothing else, we can get to the end of our lives and say, I did my best. I did what I could to protect what I cared about. Here's what you can do on these topics today. There's so much we can do, but there's one single choice I want to focus on because it's the most powerful thing that any of us can do right now, today, to make a difference. There's a simple truth that we can choose to acknowledge or not. We are eating the oceans to death. And if the oceans die, our planet as we know it will no longer exist. And life on Earth will become very difficult, possibly deadly, to any who are here. That could be within a couple generations. The simple truth is if we want to see our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren enjoy a stable Earth which supports life as abundantly as it does now, we've got to stop eating so much seafood. It may be an uncomfortable truth for some of us, but it's still a truth. It's a similar choice as far as, okay, I have a very high risk of lung cancer maybe, so I can smoke or not smoke. The choice is up to me. Nobody can force me to do it, and it's really nobody else's business necessarily. But when I'm smoking, the people around me are breathing it in as well, which is not good for them, and it's certainly putting my health at risk in the long term. If we feel that we would choose not to smoke in that circumstance, what keeps us from no longer eating seafood? Our long-term health is at stake. If we drive down global demand and signal to fishing corporations that they no longer have such a massive market to exploit and serve, then we can allow the oceans to restore themselves for life to thrive again. And then maybe in 50 years, we can start eating more seafood again or something if many of us choose to do so. But we don't need to, to be healthy. And the oceans need a rest. We heard Tamara speak about the beauty and vitality in the marine protected areas that she's been lucky enough to dive in. Her words were, it's what the ocean was meant to be. We have to give the ocean ecosystems we're jeopardizing a chance to rebound. Fish-free Fridays, for example, is not enough for this. If you must eat seafood, do so maybe once a week at most, or once a month, or once a year, or make the choice to stop consuming it altogether. It's got to be more meaningful than just a small break at this point, I think. And as we addressed briefly before our interview, and as we also discussed last year with our guest Keegan Kuhn, co-director of the Netflix documentary Cowspiracy, this extends to all animal products. It's not just seafood. 40% of the fish we take out of the ocean are fed to land animals that we're raising for human consumption. So consuming animals in any form is part of this conversation. Here's some good news. This is healthy for us. We know now that there are thousands upon thousands of vegan and vegetarian athletes, celebrities, influencers, writers who've shown us who are living proof that eating a primarily or fully plant-based diet is perfectly healthy and in many cases more healthy than a diet high in animal products. That myth that we need meat or eggs or dairy to be healthy is kind of busted at this point. And pioneering doctors and researchers have shown us that it is very healthy to eat this way to reverse heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and so many other chronic conditions. Personally, I've been vegan for 12 years, with the exception of maybe 10 meals or so early on when I was transitioning that weren't vegan. I've had my nutritional levels tested regularly over the last 12 years, and I've been told by every doctor that they wish that every patient had the vitamin and mineral levels that I had in my blood. So what's good for the planet is also good for us. If you're not convinced about the power of making this choice or about the information around the health of it, there are a lot of resources out there for you. There are dozens of documentaries that focus on this topic. Cowspiracy, of course, is one. Seaspiracy is another that we've mentioned on this episode. Forks Over Knives, Food Inc., Eating Animals, based on the book by author Jonathan Safran Fair, Earthlings, Dominion. These will all give you a sense of what's going on with the industry farming of animals for consumption and what that's causing on the earth, and also the health benefits of choosing a plant-based diet, both for the health of the planet and also for the health of our bodies. What the health 
also on Netflix and created by Keegan and Kip, who created Cowspiracy, is a fantastic documentary if you really want to know more about the health implications of eating an animal product-free diet. And if you'd like to dive deeper into the health of our oceans, what's going on out there, and what we can do to be part of the solution, here are a few other really great documentaries to get you inspired. Check out Mission Blue, featuring prominent scientist and passionate ocean protector Dr. Sylvia Earle, all about her fight to protect our oceans with marine protected areas. You can learn more about Sea Shepherd and their work by watching Watson, about Captain Paul Watson, or Defend, Conserve, Protect, which is rentable on Amazon Prime. Blackfish is a chilling but really powerful documentary about the downsides of animal entertainment and trading in animals like orcas and dolphins amongst organizations like SeaWorld and others. And The Cove is another which gets into even more detail about the Japanese dolphin run in Taiji which takes place, unfortunately, on a regular basis and feeds the animal entertainment industry as well as other industries. There's so much information available if you're curious about transitioning to a plant-based diet, what that means for you and for the planet, and how to do it in a way that's sustainable and satisfying and delicious for you. And if I can ever be a resource, email us, podcast at We Can Remake the World. I'll talk to any of you about my choice and how I made that transition and what I believe it's done for me and what I know it's done for the planet. Our challenge for today, which we do during every episode, we're calling the Earth Warrior Challenge. Inspired by Sea Shepherd, because they are nothing if not Earth Warriors, make a choice to alter your behaviors in some way that benefits the Earth, and stick to it. Make it a long-term choice. If you eat seafood or animal products of any kind, you can choose to remove them from your diet completely or partially if you need a transition period. If you use disposable products that could easily be replaced by reusables of some kind, plastics or paper products, make a commitment to replace that disposable product indefinitely with reusable options. Don't ever go back to the disposables. To prevent further waste from entering our soils and our oceans at a critical time. If you have the choice between car, train, bus, or plane travel, choose train or bus, or bike, every time for as long as you can sustain it or build volunteering with an Earth-focused organization into your routine, into your monthly schedule, your weekly schedule, something that's consistent. Choose something that you know will have a powerful impact on the health of the Earth, and take action that you can sustain, and tell other people about the choice you've made, why you've made it. Do your best to inspire them, or at least inform them. The more of us who become Earth warriors, the more conversations like the one we just had with tomorrow will take place around the world. And soon we could be speaking about the amazing miracle that we brought about in saving our oceans from disastrous results and a total collapse in ecosystems. It's time now to do what must be done because it's the right thing to do, no matter how hopeless it feels or seems at times. We cannot change the world if we don't first change ourselves. So that's our challenge to you. If you'd like to learn more about Sea Shepherd, and there's a lot of amazing stuff that we couldn't cover during this episode, visit seashepherd.org to catch up on the latest campaigns and their progress, to watch short films created by the crews on Sea Shepherd vessels, which invite you into the current campaigns and shows you a glimpse into what's going on out there on the oceans, to connect with their offices around the globe, and also to better understand how you can be part of saving our oceans and protecting marine wildlife from overfishing and the collapse of ecosystems. There's also a great FAQ page at seashepherd.org if you're curious about volunteering on a Sea Shepherd vessel, which is usually a minimum of two to three months. You can also learn about volunteering opportunities that don't require you to travel or serve on board. You can also, of course, donate, if that's the simplest and most practical way for you to support the organization and their mission of defending, conserving, and protecting global marine life, and therefore, all life. As always, we'll post all of these links on the Sea Shepherd episode page at WeCanRemakeTheWorld.com, where we also post links to all of the data, studies, and research that we reference during every episode. We don't throw these numbers out lightly. We trace back to the source every time. There's a lot for you to dig into for today's episode, so definitely check us out at our online home. Thanks, as always, for making time for us and making time for this conversation 
to learn more about our guest today and to learn more about what's going on around planet Earth, why we should care, and what we can do to change the story into one of hope, purpose, and a more positive long-term path. If you enjoyed today's episode, if you learned something from it, or if it inspired you or shocked you into a new way of seeing the world, please share it with others. Help us to grow this conversation that we're inviting you to be part of, a crucial conversation about who we want to be in the world and how we want to be in the world and what we can do to work together to reflect the world that we want to see. Give us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening on, which also helps the platforms to share our show and spread this message. I want to leave you today with a reminder that nothing is impossible. No matter how huge our problems seem, the things we can do to turn them around are powerful, even if they seem small at first. Japanese whaling vessels were ignoring international law against whaling for years before Sea Shepherd began to intervene in the southern Atlantic Ocean. With persistence from Sea Shepherd and growing global awareness of the fight that they had taken on, whale operations in the southern half of our entire planet have been effectively halted. Our guests, and especially the ones from this year, it seems like, are all examples of how powerful we can be as individuals and as communities, both locally and globally. Don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Commit yourself every day to doing what you can do, to take a stand for what you feel is the right thing. Nothing is impossible if we commit ourselves to each other and if we do everything in our power to make change. Truly, nothing. Until next time. Every one of us has the capacity to bring forth change. Every one of us. The problem seems enormous and overwhelming, and it totally is, but if everybody just takes one step in the right direction, we, we all have enormous power to truly uh, change the outcome of these stories.